again for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about reducing carbon footprint uh, emissions essentially from just transportation. So uh, looking at mostly uh, vehicles, personal passenger vehicles, but also talking about um, air travel as well. Uh, this is my first time talking on this subject, speaking on the subject, so I would appreciate feedback. And if I miss anything or forget anything, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions or, or acknowledge that and I'll get it in for, for next time. I uh, very regularly talk on waste and recycling, so I'm really excited to talk about something different this time. So um, thanks for sticking with me through this, this first presentation. Um, so just a little bit about Sustainable Wenatchee, if you're not familiar with our organization. Uh, we are a small nonprofit. I'm the only staff member and we're relatively new. I co-founded the organization in late 2017, so we're about three and a half years old now. Uh, and we do presentations and education similar to this. Our, our mission is to promote a culture of environmental stewardship and social sustainability in the Wenatchee Valley in North Central Washington. Um, we do that by educating and inspiring people to live more sustainable lives. And so we are a not political organization, nonpartisan, uh, just talking about voluntary behavior change. Um, so I won't be talking about any policy this evening, just things that people can do um, individually to, to change, um, to reduce their negative impact on the environment. So Sustainable Wenatchee offers education uh, primarily for adults so far, but we're hoping to kind of branch out to offer, also offer youth education. Um, and we do events, as you see here, this is our Earth Day Fair, which we were so happy to be able to do this last April, just last month um, down at Pibus. So why focus on transportation in North Central Washington? Uh, we have a relatively unique carbon footprint compared to definitely globally and also compared to the rest of the country. Uh, I couldn't find great information to, to give a good visual of our specific carbon footprint in our area in North Central Washington. So we're gonna have to adapt this a little bit. Um, you'll see here, this is for the whole state of Washington. And this includes electricity, which is not a part of our local carbon footprint because we have our clean abundant hydropower uh, that we get our electricity from, which is carbon uh, neutral. So you can kind of just erase that little blue sliver there, which of course then makes the rest of the pie get bigger. So I'd estimate that in our area, you can assume that transportation makes up about half of our carbon footprint here. And you can compare that to uh, our, our US greenhouse gas emissions are closer to probably about 30%. So it's definitely a big chunk of uh, our personal carbon footprints in the area. And so it's a great one to focus on when trying to, to reduce your carbon footprint. And of course, this is a very personal topic. It really depends on your living situation, your uh, the family or, or uh, you know that you live with, uh, the type of car you drive, if you drive, how much you drive, if you fly very often. So um, everything I say, of course, take with a little bit of a grain of salt because it is kind of a personal issue depending on um, all of those factors. And like I said, I'm gonna mostly focus on personal transportation, um, talking about a lot of, about passenger vehicles, but we'll also talk about air travel and vacationing, uh, plus a little bit about freight and, and delivery of goods. So for the uh, data lovers out here, this is just a closer look. Um, this is from the Seattle Times, courtesy of the Department of Ecology, looking at our Washington state um, emissions. Um, this was from 2015, so it's a little bit dated, but it does a good job of breaking down from these top three sources at the bottom. You'll see the blue is transportation, uh, which is the largest portion um, and the biggest portion of that broken down is on-road gasoline with jet fuel and on-road diesel sharing about an equal portion of about um, eight metric tons each. So uh, that just gives you a little bit better of a look of, of how that transportation uh, statewide kind of breaks down. So what can we do to reduce these emissions? Of course, the first Suggestion would be to drive less. And I know that's uh, easier said than done. Often I find when you're talking about sustainability, even when you're talking about waste or something, it's always about thinking ahead, planning ahead. So if you don't wanna make waste, you bring your own water bottle or you bring your own bag to the grocery store and plan ahead, or you plan your snacks or your meals when you're out and about so you don't have to buy something and then have that waste. And it's true with driving as well. If you can 
um, plan your trips and try to kind of group them geographically as you're making your plans maybe for the week you're looking into okay i'm going to need a costco trip uh, my family lives in sunny slope that's on the far end of town which isn't that far but still you know for wenatchee is kind of as far as it gets i'm going to make sure if i need to go to fred meyer i do it on the same day um, so kind of planning ahead to make sure that you're combining your errands as you can um, and then changing a work routine this is something that two years ago i think a lot of people when they hear that would say well, I can't do that. That's not going to work, you know, for my job specifically. And because of the pandemic, we've seen for people who work in an office setting, we've all adapted and, and made it happen. And so now maybe you can telecommute when you really thought before, oh, my boss would never let me do that. Or that's really not an option. A lot of us have found out of necessity that it is. So I hope to see that some of that continues if that's um, an efficient way for people to, to work and stay home. Even if it's one day a week, maybe you know on Fridays you work from home and you save your, your commute. Or maybe it's shifting to a four day work week and working at four tens and then you know being able to, to save yourself that one day of commuting, um, which would make a little bit of a difference every week. Uh, the second suggestion is get a buddy system, carpooling. So that really depends, of course, on the type of work you have and your schedule. And if you have someone in your, your area or neighborhood that you could carpool with, um, but sometimes that can work. Um, maybe that's carpooling to over to the west side for to run errands or to um, whatever you might have to do and going over to Seattle. Of course, there's all sorts of social things. Um, an example for, for me is I'm in a book club and my neighbor runs it. And it's like there was one time where we went downtown and I sat next to her and I thought, oh, we live right next to each other and we absolutely could have carpooled together. Um, so just thinking about the different things you do, whether it's church or social activities or kids activities and how you might um, plan ahead to ride together there. Um, and one, another thing that I think that uh, could work well when you're, it's kind of thinking outside of the box a little bit when you're thinking about the buddy system is uh, riding bikes. And this is, I'll, I'll address this later in active transportation, but if you are interested in potentially commuting by bike, but a little bit nervous, which I absolutely understand riding on the streets can be a little bit intimidating, maybe finding and who works near you or lives near you who'd be willing to uh, be your bike buddy and you guys can, you know, uh, they can kind of pick you up. I know a lot of people who are really into biking and cycling will be happy to come get you and, and you can kind of caravan to work that way. Um, and I've taken advantage of this when I lived in Tacoma with people who are more experienced. So maybe finding uh, a buddy system in that regard of someone who would be willing to kind of show you the ropes when it comes to recruit, uh, commuting by bike is an option as well. For some green driving tips, of course, if you have the option, you should always choose your most efficient vehicle. Uh, for people who live in a, a household that has more than one vehicle, um, I think a lot of families might have, you know, the smaller, more efficient car and then the bigger car for whatever reason, trying to choose that, that more efficient one. Um, in my family, I drive a, a Prius and my husband drives a, um, forerunner which we use to pull our, our tent trailer when we're camping and also go over the passes with four-wheel drive and that kind of thing so whenever we can of course we take the prius even if that's maybe not the most comfortable option and we're we're packed in there a little bit if it's good weather and we're not pulling that tent trailer we really need to be you know choosing that more efficient vehicle uh, I am no mechanic, but keeping your engine maintained and your tires properly inflated, I know can really help with fuel efficiency. So you can kind of search for your specific car and what that might be. Um, less junk in your trunk, meaning less weight in, in your car. If you can lighten up your car, you're gonna get a little bit better fuel efficiency. And then finally, the kind of classic tip, drive like a grandma. So no, slow and steady, um, not crazy acceleration, not speeding. Um, essentially boring driving is green driving. So that's the way to get the most fuel efficiency. And then finally, being idle free, which can be a big one if that's a habit you have. And that's um, important enough for Sustainable Wenatchee that we actually have engaged in a um, campaign to encourage people to turn off their vehicles. So we just did a pilot, we're doing one this spring um, for idle free zones. And uh, we hope to continue this every spring and fall. This pilot was focused on uh, small schools, private schools, daycares, and um, preschools, because I noticed 
within my own personal life, dropping off my kids that a lot of parents, I think kind of mindlessly just were forgetting maybe to turn off their car or didn't really think about it. Uh, but on beautiful days like today where there's really no need for heat or air conditioning, any reason to leave it on, um, I was seeing that happen a lot. And so um, there's three really great reasons to turn off your car. One is that, of course, we're talking about climate tonight. It emits greenhouse gases. Um, another is that it causes local air pollution, which is really important when we're talking about these like preschools and daycares because um, young kids who are, have developing lungs, they breathe in more air per pound of body weight. And so it can be really harmful um, around these toxic fumes. And it has been documented around like public schools and things that the air can get kind of toxic at, at pickup time. Um, so just for public health, it's a good idea to turn off cars. And then of course it wastes money. And if you've got a big rig and you're just sitting there, you're getting, you know, it, it could have an impact on your wallet as well when you get zero miles per gallon. So uh, try to remind people of the three good reasons to turn it off. And also that there's kind of a myth sometimes that um, it's, it adds wear and tear on your car to turn it off and on. And that's really not true for any modern vehicle. So if your car is, is very old, maybe uh, I think 70s were the was the last time where that could be true, where, where the wear and tear uh, might be bad on your starter or on your engine. But anything that's modern, 80s or newer, I would say, if you're going to be waiting for 10 seconds or more, they say it's better to turn it off. And if you idle for a really long time, it actually can be bad for your engine because it's not running at that optimal heat that it needs to. Um, so this is a pilot we're doing, and we're going to hope to expand it to um, more areas. So we'd really like to get in with the public schools, especially elementary schools in the future. Of course, all the drive-throughs, there's, you know, fast food, coffee, pharmacy, drive-throughs, banks, all sorts of drive-throughs now. And curbside pickup, you know, might continue on even as the pandemic uh, wanes. And so uh, trying to reach out and offer signage for places like that um, and hopefully partnering maybe with Menachee Valley College and some places where there's a lot of cars that park and potentially idle. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And this is sponsored by Confluence Health and CVCH because of the, the public health component. So we're thankful for their financial sponsorship of this uh, campaign. So those are our green driving tips. Uh, another way you can reduce your carbon emissions is keeping your car, but trying your best to leave it at home. Um, and one way to do that is to take public transportation, of course. Uh, right now, Link Transit is free, and I believe that they are considering keeping that free service. Um, so you can kind of stay tuned for that. Uh, and what's so amazing about our local public transportation is the fact that we have electric buses, and it's really at the forefront nationally um, of, of being really progressive with electrifying the fleet here. Um, so that's just an amazing thing to support and to take advantage of. Um, there's also Wenatchee Valley Shuttle, which goes, heads over to SeaTac, I think about three times a day in the summer, and you can hop on that for $100 a seat, which if you're um, a single driver, that's probably better to hop in their shuttle rather than to drive over your own car, depending on uh, what kind of car you drive. So that's a great option to get over to the west side as well. Um, and then linking Link Transit with active transportation is a wonderful option. If you um, want to, if you live a little bit further away from a, a bus stop or maybe your destination is far from a bus stop, you can bring your bike with you. So I think all, all Link buses have that um, device on the front where you can put a, a bike on. When I lived in Tacoma, I would sometimes do that because it was mostly downhill to get to my work, but it was mostly uphill to get home. So I'd put my bike on the bus to get back home or here. It's really great in the summer if you want that cool, fresh trip to work on your bike in the morning, but you don't want to bike home when it's 100 degrees at five o'clock, then you can take uh, the bus back. So that's a great combo that you can do both active transportation and public transportation and really benefit from both. Um, in terms of getting on your bike, like I mentioned earlier, it can be, I know, really intimidating. Um, and so I really encourage anyone who's interested in that to check out bikewenatchevalley.org. They have a lot of great resources there with um, maps, bike maps and things like that. And I know at one point they had a bike buddy system or kind of program that they had set up 
I don't know that very many people have taken advantage of that, but I'm sure that if you reached out to anyone, it's, it, I think Bike Wenatchee Valley um, is put on by the Regional Bicycle Advisory Council, which I sit on. And I know that there's a lot of people in that group that would be very happy to help if, if anyone expressed interest in wanting to um, commute by bike and, um, and get on the roads. I know that there's a lot of supportive people that would help you do that. I benefited from that greatly. I worked at the city of Tacoma's Office of Environmental Policy and Sustainability and was the only person in the office that was not a bike commuter. And those people were really supportive of me and um, encouraging me kind of on etiquette on where to ride on the road and claim the lane, which is easier said than done to, um, you know, take up the whole lane um, <clears throat> when you're on kind of a busy road. But I know that there's people in that in that bike group that would be happy to support you if, if anyone is interested. I'm personally not a bike commuter right now. I have two young kids. And like I said, I live up in Sunny Slope. So those are my, <laughs> my two excuses, but I hope to get back on my bike again someday. Oh, and then I was also gonna mention e-bikes. I don't have an e-bike. I think they're amazing. And I think that mentioning like the, the barrier of living up in Sunny Slope, living in, on the foothills here in the, our beautiful valley, you know, that the hills can be a barrier. And I think e-bikes will be an awesome uh, asset for some people who really want to bike, but those hills are intimidating and, and getting back up. So um, there's, that's a great option if you're interested in an electric bike, you should look into that as well. Okay, and then finally, if uh, you've done those things or you're past um, kind of looking into those things and you're ready, ready to ditch the internal combustion engine, we will talk about um, the advantages of electric vehicles, especially in NCW. So I mentioned our, our abundant clean hydropower. So uh, an electric vehicle that's fueled here has no carbon footprint from, from the fuel that they're running off of which is amazing. It might be one of the best places in the country to um, drive an electric vehicle. Um, and one thing that I recently thought of with these, these shortages, these issues they've had with hackers on, on the other side of the country is that you'll never be a victim of the, those gas shortages or any sort of issues with um, getting gas, which would be even better if you had you know, rooftop solar, you could kind of pair those two together and you're good to go. Even if the grid's down or there's a power outage, you can, you can fuel your car. So looking at some um, information about electric vehicles, I do have to put a little bit of a um, asterisk on here that, like I said, I, I still drive a Prius. I don't have an electric car yet. I'm hoping this is the year. Uh, we're planning on maybe buying one later this year, but um, I definitely recommend if you're interested in this and want more information than I can offer tonight, that plug in NCW is a, a great local group and they're extremely knowledgeable and really happy to share information uh, and they have a good website to visit. So uh, reach out to them if I uh, don't have the information you're looking for, you'd like to, to find out more. So looking at, of course, uh, the cost of a vehicle is one of the first things that you'll consider if you're, if you're interested in getting an electric car. Um, and they do have an increased cost from the get-go. The purchase price uh, for a comparable vehicle will be more expensive for an electric vehicle. I listed some of the popular ones here. You can get a, a, these are all 2021 brand new vehicles. So of course, you get a certified pre-owned LEAF for probably 15,000, probably half of that. Um, that would still go maybe 80 miles, uh, which is plenty to get around town and even um, to, to travel outside of town. But these are all just the, the brand new costs for these. So about 32 for a Leaf or 36 for a Chevrolet Bolt. Uh, for 45,000, you can get yourself a BMW. And then Tesla ranges from uh, the Model 3, which is the most inexpensive vehicle that starts at 40,000 to their most expensive that starts at 80,000. Um, so those are obviously really high ticket vehicles. Um, the nice thing about uh, electric cars is that they do have uh, much reduced maintenance and fueling. So, uh, you know, in our area, we pay two or three cents per kilowatt hour. So charging your vehicle, um, Chelan County PUD had said that it's about the equivalency of paying 22 cents per gallon, um, to kind of to compare what you would pay for a more conventional vehicle. So they say if you drove about 12,000 miles, which is a, about average in one year, you would pay anywhere from 85 to $130 per year. 
which driving a Prius, I, I pay nowhere near that. I imagine that there's probably some big trucks out there that pay that per month. Um, but that's just incredible that for a, a year's worth of fuel, you could pay only $85 um, for your fuel. They also have uh, decreased maintenance. There's not oil changes and, and that kind of thing. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. So over the lifetime of, of a vehicle, it does, I think, pay for itself um, depending on the different incentives you can get and um, how long you keep the vehicle. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, and then one thing that people often bring up that could be a concern is this idea that the battery will wear out. You'll have to replace the battery. I know that was a big deal several years ago when Nissan Leaf was getting really popular. Um, and according to Consumer Reports, they estimate that the average EV's light battery lifespan will be about 200,000 miles, which at 12,000 miles a year is nearly 17 years of use. So that's reassuring. I don't know the statistics, but I don't think many of us drive a car for 17 years. So um, they should last quite a long time. And I'm hopeful that 17 years from, from now, we'll have a much better recycling system for these, these uh, batteries to be able to get uh, the resources out of them to reuse that. And that is another concern, talking about the carbon footprint that actually goes into making electric vehicles uh, with the lithium ion batteries. And so you do have to kind of consider the life cycle. So while they're zero emission, zero carbon from use, you do need to kind of consider what goes into making these vehicles and um, looking at the carbon emissions from the production of these vehicles, especially once um, this is a study that was made in China, they could be up to 60% more carbon um, intensive in the production compared to a conventional vehicle. Um, but as these, as the production is kind of spreading globally, I, it's expected that that will go down. But always good to look at the life cycle when you're making a big purchase like this. So uh, for incentives, there is the Washington state sales tax exemption. So uh, for up to $45,000 for a new EV and up to $30,000 for a used one, you'll get up to uh, $2,500 off the sticker price. Uh, in Washington state and that runs through 2025. Uh, for the federal tax income credit, uh, that's a little bit different where they're, depending on the manufacturer, they start to phase them out once they hit 200,000 vehicles. So this credit would no longer apply for a Chevy or a Tesla. Uh, if you have been paying attention to the news, it looks like the Biden administration might make changes to this. Right now, this is a federal income tax credit. So when they say it's up to 7,000, that's not, they're not going to write you a check for that much. You have to be able to uh, get the credit on your income taxes, which is definitely not true, I think, for a, a big chunk of people. Uh, if you, if they're going to give you a credit, it's only up to what you're owed. Um, so they're not going to make up the difference. So it's a little bit false. You know, you think you can just take $7,000 off the, the price and that's not how it works. Um, but I believe that the Biden administration may be making a change to more of a true, like at, per, at the point of purchase rebate. Um, I don't know that they've released that information. So that all might change sometime soon. So there's some good incentives there. And then um, there is an added fee that EV owners have to pay because they don't pay for taxes on fuel to help pay for highways. They pay an annual vehicle registration fee of $150 to make up for that. In looking at range, um, we'll, I'll show a, a map here coming up and kind of give an example, but they start maybe around 60 or 75, um, like looking at some of the older leaves from several years ago, up to some of the newer ones go over 300 miles on a charge. Uh, and charging, it gets a little bit confusing. There's level one, level two, and DC fast chargers. So level one is just your, your average plug-in uh, that you could do. And if you are just using your vehicle for in town, that's gonna be totally adequate to just plug it in overnight and get around. Um, if you, I think most EV owners probably have an electrician install a level two charger, which will do it much faster. Um, and you can always have you know full range of your vehicle every morning. And then when you're on the go, there's the DC fast chargers that can charge between 20 and 30 minutes. Um, get up to 80% in that quick of time. Uh, with installing a home charger, you're going to probably be looking at the very cheapest is around $400, but up to over $1,000. And that also has a tax credit, a federal tax credit um, that applies there, I think up to $1,000. So here is a map of Washington, just to kind of give you an idea of how many uh, chargers there are. The green ones are the level two and the yellow are the fast chargers. 
So as an example, um, there are, <clears throat> like if we were looking at like a 2018 leaf, so a few years old, that gets about 150 mile range. Um, you could get, you could just barely get to SeaTac. You'd probably have to cruise on in. So I would say you'd want to charge maybe in Clee for a little while um, or something like that part way. Uh, to get to Spokane, you're probably going to need to charge. There's a, a fast charger in Ritzville that you could take advantage of that's maybe kind of the halfway point. And then if you wanted to go to all, all the way to Portland, you're definitely gonna to wanna to charge a couple of times. So that just gives you an idea that um, there's definitely plenty of chargers around to really get wherever you need to go um, in within the state with just a couple of charges. And again, here's uh, Plugin NCW is a great website to, to check out if you're interested. They have a lot of really localized good information there. Um, and here's a little map of some of Washington's DC fast charging stations. So you can really get anywhere from north to Blaine all the way south to Vancouver um, over Highway 2 has several fast charging stations and as does I-90. So you're pretty well covered there uh, to get around the state. And then I wanted to give just a quick shout out to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. These are um, a tad bit more controversial. A lot of people uh, really like electric vehicles and kind of wonder why we would need to invest in a new uh, technology, which I totally agree with. Um, but there is there are some pros. So Douglas County PUD, as many of you probably have heard, is going to start making hydrogen fuel, I think, later this year, or early next year. And there's plans for a fueling station to come to Washington. Right now, there are no fueling stations in Washington. Uh, I think there's one up in Vancouver, BC. And then the next you'll see is Oregon or maybe even, all, I think it's all the way down in California. So talking a little bit about the future here. But um, fuel cell electric vehicles are run by hydrogen fuel, which you kind of gas up more similarly to a conventional vehicle, but the hydrogen powers an electric battery. So it's still an electric vehicle but powered by hydrogen. And that's as far as I understand it. So don't ask me any technical questions, but I, I understand they are zero emission vehicles. They only emit water vapor. Um, and so they're only a low carb carbon footprint or, or zero carbon footprint vehicle if they're fueled by green hydrogen, which something I read said only about 1%. This is a couple years old, so it's probably not quite accurate, but only 1% of hydrogen is green hydrogen made with renewable resources like ours will be in Douglas County. Um, and I, the electrolyzers that they're going to start making with renewable energy to make more green hydrogen is like skyrocketing. It's, there's definitely going to be a lot more um, supply for green hydrogen. But at the time of writing a couple of years ago, it was a very, very small portion. So that's something to consider. If you're, hyd if you're fueling your, your uh, fuel cell vehicle with hydrogen that's made with fossil fuels. It's not really a, a zero carbon vehicle there. I did write a blog about this recently. Um, so you can check that out at sustainablewenatchee.org slash blog. I also had another article that was a little bit different in, in the Wenatchee world that you can search for. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing to consider that there might be this option for the future. There's definitely some pros. It's more accessible for people who don't have access to charge. If you don't have a garage, if you don't have, uh, if you are a renter or, or live in a condo or something and you can't easily charge, it's definitely more accessible for people who, um, you know, just need to go to a fueling station. There's no range anxiety like there would be with an electric vehicle. The fueling time is very similar. It's a very similar experience for what can, consumers are used to with fueling a car. Um, you are diversifying a little bit. There is some concern, I think, for utilities of what happens when everybody gets an electric car and comes home at five o'clock and plugs in and it puts a huge demand on the grid. Um, so it's kind of nice to maybe diversify from that and not have everybody have an electric car is, is one opinion. Um, cons, the cars are very expensive, you know, similar to electric vehicles, but even more so because they're so new. Um, of course, there's very limited charging. It's not even an option here in Washington state yet. Um, and again, there's not, not all hydrogen is green hydrogen. Um, so there are definitely some, some cons to consider. All right, and now we will move to talking about airline travel. Uh, so this of course depends on if you're kind of a frequent flyer or not, but 
uh, you can have a very, very large carbon footprint from air travel that can dwarf any other good deeds you do all throughout the year. Um, so it's something to really consider. Um, there, you know, ever since like Greta Thunberg, you know, there's kind of a bit of, um, what was the phrase I saw, flight shame, you know, just admitting that you're flying anymore is, you know, it's almost a sin for environmentalists. And so we'll kind of talk about that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the differences between cars uh, and, and planes and how it's different um, <clears throat> with radiative forcing and uh, some of the things that they're trying to do to improve. So uh, this picture here is of what they call a winglet, which helps to improve efficiency um, on planes and they're looking at biofuels and things. So there are some things in the industry that they're trying to make them more efficient and it has gotten a lot better over the last like 30 years. Uh, airplanes have been, become much more efficient but air travel has also skyrocketed. You know, you used to hear, it seems like back in the day of a lot of people, you, you met a lot of people who had never been on a plane and anymore, it's just so much more common uh, for, for people, especially Americans and people of privilege to, um, to fly by air. That's, it's a lot more common than it used to be. So definitely something to consider when talking about a carbon footprint. So I mentioned radiative forcing, which again, don't totally understand the science on this, but from what I understand, um, the carbon emissions from planes, because they're such, in such high altitude, have an increased effect on global warming. And from what I understand, this is still um, maybe not debated, but kind of being figured out by scientists, but it sounds like it could increase the emissions by as much as 90%. So if you're looking at the emissions from um, a car, a, a plane, you might have to multiply that uh, to really get the true impact of, of what it will have for global warming. Uh, and so sometimes that can be the difference in, in tipping the scales in favor of driving as opposed to flying somewhere. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that rather than try to explain radiative forcing further, but something to, to definitely consider. Um, and to note when you're looking at maybe doing a carbon calculator online that sometimes that includes radiative forcing and sometimes it doesn't they'll normally tell you or ha even have an option where you can click to kind of turn that on to consider that um, when you're when you're trying to calculate your emissions for flying so i have a couple of graphs just to kind of illustrate um, how much flying can really contribute to your carbon footprint um, you'll see the biggest one here on this graph uh, on, on ways to recommend to reduce your carbon footprint is to have one less child. Um, that is sometimes kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to talking about carbon footprint. I highly doubt I will ever offer a presentation on why you should have less children, <laughs> but it is something if you're planning a family to consider, because of course, American children come with huge carbon footprints. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. So the next one is not using a car. And then you'll see next is canceling a transatlantic flight, which is, you know, just for one transatlantic flight, that's a huge carbon footprint, about the same equivalency of, of buying green energy, which is what we do here with our hydropower. Um, and then, of course, a vegetarian or vegan diet is something that you can do, uh, and then switching to a hybrid. So that shows you just with one single transatlantic flight, how much of an impact that can have on your carbon footprint. And this is a graph to kind of um, show something similar. So a round trip flight from Denver to, to New York City is about 1900 um, carbon dioxide equivalent in, in kilograms. And it's about exactly the same for driving a car uh, 7,500 miles. And I think my Prius gets about 45 miles per gallon. So that's, that's the better part of a year for driving for the average person, at least six months of driving. And, and you're gonna blow that in one round trip flight to Denver, um, from Denver to, to New York. And then very important to compare it to, you know, you can see what a flight does um, in comparison to one person's entire carbon footprint for an entire year in a place like India. So um, the, the final comparison here is running a refrigerator for a year, which again isn't relevant to us because of our clean electricity, but I think it's a good reminder. I get a lot of questions sometimes about things that people kind of are focusing in on and it's sometimes a good idea, I think, to take a step back and really put it in perspective. And I'm not gonna uh, downplay anything that people are really passionate about, but like 
recycling, for instance, um, and, and people get really worked up about, I really wish I could recycle this one thing. Um, but when you kind of look at it and take a step back, it's like, well, are you really being concerned about the right thing? And I would say definitely air travel is something that you should be concerned about. So if you're doing an awesome job and really concerned about recycling all year long, but then you have an annual trip somewhere tropical, um, it's definitely something to consider because I think you could probably recycle well your whole life um, and then blow it by just a couple of, of flights. So my point was don't get too worked up about that extra fridge in your garage, I guess with that last piece there. So some, some tips for reducing emissions from flying. The first one of course is uh, flying less and um, you can opt to drive for shorter flights. This one, it's a little bit tricky. I did a couple of calculators online and it's it, there's so many variables to consider what kind of car you drive, how many people are in the car. Um, so that's just something to know if you're trying to kind of calculate it. I tried to figure out flying from Pangborn to SeaTac, which is better to fly or to drive. Um, and I, I wanted to do a little bit more research because I want to compare a couple of different calculators. But from what I found uh, for driving my car, a 2016 Prius V, it would be about 0.03 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, flying would be 0.02, but that's assuming one person. So one seat on the airplane would be 0.02 or driving my car would be 0.03. So if you've got a car full of people, of course, then that changes the dynamic. Um, and then looking at like my husband's old car, which was a clunker 98 forerunner uh, that he loved, that would be 0.08. So it would be actually the same theoretically if you had four people in his old forerunner um, and four seats on the airplane. So kind of considering, you know, if you're packing people in and, and being efficient in a car, it might be the same as flying. Now, the calculator I used didn't ask what kind of airplane it was, it just, you know, said from one airport to the other. And so there's so many things to consider. I don't know what, what size of airplane. So I'm don't quote me on any of those numbers, but it just goes to show that you can, you know, try to do a little bit of calculations to see what would be potentially better um, driving versus flying. Uh, another thing you can do is um, do business virtually, whether that's doing virtual conferences or having virtual meetings rather than flying for business. Um, this again, for the pandemic was probably something people would say, who wants to go to a virtual conference? But when that's your only option, people make it work and it's actually kind of nice, especially for us introverts who hate all the networking at conferences. So those are some options that will hopefully continue. Uh, and then choosing a staycation. So um, there's so many beautiful places around here, really affordable places just going camping with your family that you can choose or really high price glitzy things like um, this gorgeous hotel up in Leavenworth, the Post Hotel. Uh, you, why go to Europe when you can go there? I've seen pictures and it just looks amazing. So, uh, you know, beautiful Lake Chelan, there's lots of really awesome places to go where you could stay virtually um, rather than fly, which I'm being a total hypocrite because I'm actually flying for vacation coming up here soon. But um, there's my pitch for a staycation. Definitely wanna try to do that uh, more often than we do. Uh, next would be choosing nonstop, which of course we all wanna do for convenience anyway. Um, there's a lot, a lot of the emissions and I kept finding different numbers, so I'm not gonna quote anything, but it seems like a good chunk of emissions from a flight come from the taxiing takeoff and landing process. It's not from just cruising at, you know, cruising altitude. And so um, it's actually much more efficient to take a long flight rather than a couple of short flights. So there's your excuse to, to opt for the, the non-flight stop, even if it's more expensive potentially because it's definitely better climate wise and, and carbon emission wise. Um, and then looking at um, when you are flying, what your options are, flying coach. Again, some of these things that seem silly to even suggest because it's so kind of elitist. I don't know how many people in here have flown a lot of first class, but if you have the habit of flying first class, it will reduce your carbon footprint by flying coach because the seats are smaller and you can fit more people in the airplane that way. So choose that option, the economy seating, and then packing light, which also seems a little silly. Uh, but if each person on the plane packed lighter, then there would be less weight and then it would need less fuel. So it doesn't hurt to try to do that as well. Um, again, you can plan ahead when you're thinking about what you're packing to and trying to reduce single use plastics, bring your own water bottle, bring your own food and things so that you're not having to buy um, 
things that will end up causing waste when you are on that flight. And then finally, if you can, by offsets, I acknowledge in talking about flying at all, it's absolutely coming from a place of privilege, you know, someone who, um, like myself or many of us who have the ability to travel to tropical, you know, foreign places. Um, and so kind of speaking to the audience, I'm assuming if you have the ability to fly, then you also might have the ability to budget for offsets. Offsets are a little bit controversial because you're not actually doing anything but buying your way out of the problem, which is very typical of us as Americans to try to do, uh, but I still do it. And um, I, I think that it's probably a good thing to do. I would say, so offsets are essentially paying someone else to do something to offset your carbon emissions that you're going to be doing. So that might be investing in a project that encourages renewable energy like solar or wind, or it might be storing carbon in some way like planting trees. Now, if you have the property, you should by all means plant your own trees and take care of those, and then you wouldn't have to buy offsets. But for the rest of us, um, offsets are a way that you can relieve your guilt and hopefully actually be doing something. I would recommend that you, you choose to um, do a lot of research and choose ones that are verified by an independent third party. Uh, I did a, a little bit of research a couple of years ago and I've been using for the past few years Native Energy. Um, and I like how they have a few different standards. Um, there's the gold standard, the verified carbon standard and the carbon action reserve. So these are kind of ways that you can verify that the offsets you're buying hopefully are really, your money is going toward uh, what they say it is. As an example of cost to offset a 0.9 metric ton carbon footprint of a single passenger from on United from New York to San Francisco in the summer, um, there's an organization called Sustainable Travel International and they run United's offset program. They have two choices. You can donate $9 to fund a wind farm in Texas or $11 for a forest conservation program in Peru. Uh, for example, from my personal um, trips, I have used Native Energy for um, a flight to Maui, where my husband's grandma lives in um, Minnesota. So we have traveled there in the summer. Um, I also combine this with propane. So I have two um, propane fueled uh, fireplaces in my home that don't heat my home. They're purely for ambiance. So it's a total guilty pleasure. And I told my husband we are not using those at all until I realized I could buy offsets for them. So I kind of grouped that when I'm buying offsets for travel, I add in for our propane and it makes me feel a little bit better, but I still try to keep them turned off. Um, so to do that, so uh, for two flights, round trip flights to Maui and three tickets to Fargo plus propane, um, I, I got all of that for under $100 at one point and that went to in Honduras funding a clean water project. So there they were, um, the, the coffee growers there living in poverty would burn fuel, firewood for um, to clean their water, to boil their water to drink. And so this program uh, offered really easy to use water filtration systems so they wouldn't have to boil their water. Um, so it, it led, this project had $90,000, not dollar, 90,000 tons CO2 equivalent savings for, for climate change. It had a, a result of 205 million liters of clean water and it benefited about 1,700 families. So again, take it or leave it. Those are your options with offsets. Um, some people are really opposed to them and think it's cheating or maybe it's not uh, really doing you know what they say they're doing. Um, but if you really wanna continue to fly, I feel like it, it helps. Um, and leave that flight guilt, that uh, the shame you have from flying anymore. And then looking at some other travel, uh, cruise ships are, that's another one that how it's just, they've got terrible, terrible carbon footprints. Um, I'm willing to fly, but I am not ever willing to take a cruise. They, what something I read said that they emit three times more passenger uh, mile per passenger mile emissions um, than air travel. So cruise ships are just really bad for emissions, but also for pollution and waste, um, and obviously for spreading <laughs> diseases like COVID. When I saw that the cruise ship industry was kind of tanking, I was the little evil 
person on my shoulder was not too upset about that. And I, I kind of hope that it doesn't come back to the full industry that it was. I understand it's it's really hard for like the Seattle economy. Um, and so there's that to consider with jobs and things, but cruise, cruising is definitely a very high carbon, it will, it will add a lot to your carbon footprint if that's uh, something you choose to do. Bus and rail are good options. Uh, the picture here I have is from Solutionary Rail, which I encourage you to check out. It's a cool idea of electrifying um, both you know, freight on rail and passenger trains. And I believe it's that's out of Sightline uh, Institute. I think it's a, a Washington uh, book and, and video that um, is the idea that we can electrify. So, um, considering when you're on vacation, what you're gonna do when you get there. So after you've considered um, getting there, maybe by flying, looking at renting a car, trying to choose a, uh, a fuel efficient option rather than maybe a fun Jeep or something like that, or choosing to ride share with Uber or Lyft instead of renting a car, um, looking at what kind of tours you're going to do. If you're going to be on a bus with a bunch of people or be some extravagant person on a helicopter tour um, with one person in a helicopter, of course, these are things to consider. Um, if you're Bill Gates. And then uh, freight. So um, I mostly fo focused on kind of getting moving people around, but it's also important when we talk about that carbon footprint and saying that about half of our carbon footprint in North Central Washington is probably from transportation. Uh, transportation of goods is included in that. So looking at the cons considering the, the goods that you buy, uh, buying less is always the most eco-friendly option, uh, but then when you can buy local for the goods you buy, try not to buy things made in China, which I know is always hard um, because it's everywhere or buying local when it comes to, to shopping for food, especially in um, different items. So that's something to consider. And then finally, looking at what is next. So kind of taking action. So calculating your carbon footprint is a great way to start. Um, you do have to go into these carbon footprint calculators with a fair amount of information. I did a couple of them and I was totally clueless about like the amount of miles I drive in a year. Um, and you're going to want to know the fuel efficiency of your car, which you can probably look up um, how much, you know, you use in home energy each year, which doesn't essentially matter here. But um, for people that might have natural gas or use propane or uh, things that can add to, to the energy used in your home, the amount you, weight, you produce in waste uh, adds to your carbon footprint. So uh, be prepared to have some information to kind of go in to get your most accurate uh, footprint. And you also don't want to use the defaults that they come up with because that's kind of just the national average. So they'll put you at, you know, 12 kilowatt, uh, 12 cents per kilowatt hour or whatever the national average is, which is several times higher what we pay here. Um, so be sure to, um, yeah, choose the different options to try to localize it as much as possible. The EPA has a good household carbon footprint calculator. I really like carbonfootprint.com, which is a UK website, uh, and they have information there about offsets as well. And that includes radiative forcing, which some of the carbon footprint uh, calculators do not. So I, I think that that's a good thing to include. Um, if you are already doing really well, if you listen to this presentation and you were patting yourself on the back, then yes, you deserve a pat on the back. Good job, because that's definitely the biggest chunk here. Um, it, if you're looking for next steps, considering your diet, um, not just eating local, but eating low on the, the food chain. So trying to opt for uh, vegetarian and vegan options and avoiding animal products whenever possible will help your carbon footprint, as we saw. Um, and considering your purchases, that you're not buying a bunch of stuff wrapped in plastic, like we're always having to do that comes from fossil fuels and not wasting and recycling. Those are kind of um, some big ones um, to, to be able to continue to shrink that carbon footprint. And then finally, uh, just reiterate to definitely research offsets if that's something you're interested in because you wanna make sure that you're doing, um, it's a verified program that you're, you're giving your money to something that's certified in, um, in actually spending your money how it should be used to actually be offsetting what you're hoping to offset. Okay, and that is my presentation. So I'm happy now to take questions. I will stop sharing here. And yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute your mic. Um, and then just a reminder that uh, 
your chat is visible to everyone, so keep comments respectful. Um, but we're, we're uh, Jan is happy to take questions. Jana, how's that uh, the anti-idling campaign going for at the preschools? Do you have a uh, some feedback yet, or uh, it's good? We, um, I mean, it's such a small pilot that it's you know hard to tell. It's, I don't think we're making a huge impact at this point. We've had a little bit of word of mouth spread, which is nice. Um, we've had like we, I did a presentation and went to Steve's Learning Center, and I had a parent. Um, who also owns a daycare. So she asked for the signs. She said, I really got to get these big diesel trucks to turn off their cars in the winter. So we have our signs now at her daycare. Um, yeah, it's hard to tell, you know, there's so many variables with like weather changing as it gets warmer and colder yeah. and things to really tell if it's successful. Uh, I haven't, we are trying to engage students as much as possible. So like with Joyful Scholars Montessori, um, they did before and after observations to kind of spy on the parents, which is fun for the kids. Um, and so I haven't, I don't have that data yet, but uh, it's nice to involve the students to be able to let them kind of gather that data um, and see if they, after the kind of campaign, they have any sort of impact. So yeah, we'll, we'll evaluate that probably next month and then move on from there to, to engage again in the fall. Great. So Jana, thank you for giving a shout out to Link Transit earlier. Sorry, I had to join a little late, but I did want to reiterate that we are free. It's completely free to write our system and it will be for at least the next year. If that's an important value for you, please reach out to our board of directors and let them know they should continue that practice. They don't hear from the community enough. Usually it's crickets in there. So <laughs> please, please give them some, some feedback about this practice, but it will continue for at least the next year. And there's plenty of room on our vehicles for more people with co the college um, not really meeting in person. We have lots of capacity. Our buses are really clean. We have a sanitation system that cleans, scrubs the air all day long. So it's very safe, very clean. We have mask policy on all of our buses. Probably will be enforced through September because we are under TSA guidelines. So if anybody has any questions about that, you can chat, hit me up in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Selena. Jenny, you may have mentioned about what's the best entity that you found that's screening these uh, offset companies that do offsets? What's the best organization? Yeah, I know there's a couple different organizations that review uh, entities that offer offsets. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when I, it's been a few years since I really did research for my personal use. Um, the the uh, three that came often were gold standard, verified carbon standard, and climate action reserve. But I honestly don't know specifically into each of the, you know, I can't recommend those three. I haven't done a lot of research. So it just kind of came up a lot um, as being, you know, independently verified. Those are leading standards. Um, I'm hesitant to, you know, necessarily endorse any specific organization, but I think those are good ones to start with. If anyone else has bought offsets and recommends anything, let me know. I know sometimes you can buy them through the airline when you're actually buying your ticket, but it's not often in the process. You have to go to the sustainability page and do it, kind of do a different transaction. So I think a few of the leading airlines do have that option. And I don't know if those are good choices or not. But. Jana, I was, I was really excited to hear how cheap offsets were. You know, I had I literally no idea like what the cost would be. And that's that's a real incentive for me to next time I fly to go ahead and do it. Um, there's no reason not to. Right. Yeah. I don't know how much they vary. Um, I like the ones like this, this Honduras water project where, you know, there's kind of the social justice impact where you're helping other people. Um, as opposed to, I mean, you're going to help people no matter what, if you're reducing, you know, your carbon emissions in the long run. Uh, I'd imagine ones that if you're, if it's only planting trees and of course maintaining the trees, which would require irrigation potentially, it's got to be somewhat of a cheap process. I have no idea, you know, where this is happening. Um, and if it's in the rainforest somewhere, maybe it's not a cheap process, but, um, 
you know, if I don't know, it seems like that wouldn't be a big cost, but a potential big uh, carbon sink, you know, a, a way to store carbon. So there's lots of different options. Like some of them were, you know, uh, renewable projects like solar and wind, but of course, planting trees is kind of the, the go-to offset, it seems that that people are doing. And I also wanted to say good job because you, you brought up a lot of stuff that I didn't know about, um, honestly. Um, so thank you. Thank yeah, you. yeah, I learned some new things too. Um, yeah, this, this is really fun to research. I actually had to do a fair amount of research for this because darn it, I don't own my own EV yet. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm gonna be uh, the expert when I go to buy one, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn. And I think some really interesting science looking into radiative forcing and some of these things that I, I wanna I learn more. I feel like I've done a fair amount on waste and I, I feel pretty confident when people ask me, you know, recycling questions and things, but I'm a little bit of a novice to this stuff. So thanks for bearing with me guys. I'm just hoping that um, electric vehicles become less elitist, you know, that it's not just all about the Tesla. I mean, Absolutely. It really is $15,000. <laughs> Mine was even less than that. Yeah. And I can charge it overnight. I live in Wenatchee with hydropower. Um, and I only charge it once a week. You know, I'm not driving far. So um, it, it is different in winter. You're going to have to charge more in winter because cold reduces your battery capacity to hold that charge. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're going up, up and over the pass, that's also difficult because the up part takes a lot of battery and then it recharges more when you go down. Right. So other things to think about, but really if you're just commuting around town um, and can afford that secondhand leaf, it's, it's, it's really great um, because we do have clean hydropower here. Now, if you live in West Virginia and you're plugging into coal, power then it's it's a different story absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah and i i did hear and i don't remember exactly where i heard this but that we don't have enough um electric vehicle charging stations technicians because i found when i was coming over i bought my leaf in everett and when i was coming over the passes and wanted to charge it um i forget if it was in snow maybe snoqualmie and the, the one charging place that I could go as a Nissan Leaf and not a Tesla, Tesla has a whole bank of charging stations. <laughs> you know, there's one for the Leafs yeah. um, and all the other ones that wasn't working. And so, you know, that's another big opportunity is really um, training. And, and I think the college will look, look at this too, is training the technicians for things like electric vehicle charging because that's where the green jobs are now. It's like, you know, what, what do we need in the decarbonized economy? And we need things like electric vehicle charging station technicians and, and those sorts of jobs that we haven't really thought about, but that are essential for the new infrastructure that we're looking at. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for bringing up this, the elitist nature of, I mean, you kind of wonder any new technology, you know, Model Ts were elitist at some point, right? And then right. everyone got one eventually, or most people, not everyone. Um, but yeah, in putting this together, it feels like so much of a place of privilege as we are in America, uh, but especially looking at the, the cost of these new vehicles or, you know, talking about air travel for tr tropical vacations. It's definitely something to consider. I hope that we can kind of expedite the process where we can get really more affordable uh, electric vehicles coming down the line soon. Right. Well, I wanted to say thank you to Jana for coming out and um, presenting to us. And thank you all for attending and your questions. Um, check out our website at ncwlibraries.org for other upcoming events. Um, and I hope you all have a great evening and thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Jana. Thanks, Jenna.